There are eight generations of Corvettes. And guess what? I don't like most of them. In the early generations, the C1 and the C2 Corvette, it was America's sports car, and it was always an affordable way to be able to hang with the big boys that cost up to five times as much. Ferrari, Lamborghini, Mercedes, BMW. Although the Corvette lacked the finesse and brand bragging rights associated with these cars, it had the brute power. 435 horsepower to be exact in the 1967. Compare that to the 1967 Lamborghini Miura, which only had 350. Look at the price. The Corvette was $4,000 when new, but the Lamborghini by comparison cost $20,000. But then in 1968, everything changed. Enter the Disco Vet. It's well regarded that the third generation of the Corvette isn't well loved amongst a lot of Corvette enthusiasts. Yes, it does have a following, but a much smaller one than the C2. It was too big of a departure in the design department for the old men who lusted after the previous generation. The gas crisis and the emissions regulations slowly brought that Corvette's power all the way down from 435 to 165 in 1975, which is just frickin' appalling, for lack of better words. Power barely improved through its lifetime, which ended in 1982. The American Dream Car was now a neutered show-off piece, an absolute dog of a car. Yet, Winston and I are too young to be tainted by the C3's reputation. When we were kids, they were still one of the most badass looking cars out there, and dare I say, even beautiful. Those lines, those hips, that massive hood, it's a stunning design. I remember as a kid driving down the long forest road for miles to get anywhere, and there was a silver one parked in someone's yard. I always told myself, I'm gonna have one of those someday. Turns out Winston had felt the same. Fast forward and Winston had already bought the generation after the C3, called the C4 Corvette. I never really liked that one as a kid, because I grew up seeing too many of them wasting away in people's front yards in pieces. The angular shape had grown on me now, and I think they look quite good, but damn! The C3 as a kid, I'll never shake that memory of how cool that car looked. So we did what any adult male likes to do. We decided to go car shop. Yo, Seamilk! Not in Vietnam. We're not in Vietnam. You know, there's something very weird going on in the background. What is that? There are some cars behind, uh, actually in front of us. Yeah. Uh, very similar cars. Very similar. And I don't know how we stumbled across two of almost the exact same thing, but we did. Why don't you show everyone? Being men in our 30s, the idea of having a car you've always wanted is more feasible than when you're younger. And when we started searching, we realized that this generation of Corvette simply didn't hold its value. They were staggeringly cheap. Now we knew getting into these cars from the beginning that we would probably want to increase the power, make some upgrades, and unfortunately in California, any car made after 1975 means you can't swap the engine or modify the car in any meaningful way. The final years of the C3 Corvette up to the 1982 made some big improvements across the cars. Suspension, interior, but they were slow, and for us we couldn't upgrade the engine, so we had to stick with pre-1975 cars. So the hunt began. We found a junkyard, more or less, that sold C3 Corvettes. Anyway, gonna turn around and show you. Okay, so let's first start off down there, that orange one, which is being worked on because, well, it's missing a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I got it for a fantastic deal. It cost less than me buying my purple Corvette, which is here, by the way. Or the motorcycle you bought. It's actually cost less than my motorcycle by quite a lot. That cost less than a motorcycle, but it's, it's in pieces. Yeah. And yours is a 1968, and mine is a 1974. Both with very weird differences. Yeah. Uh, because of what's under the hood. Yeah. Um, I guess we can talk a little bit about the cars. Yeah. Um, so mine is a little bit more expensive because it's more complete. Yeah. Like uh, if we were going to go to buy some period correct year, yours would have cost like $50,000. Fantastic. I got a fantastic deal. But the thing about that one is, it's got no power steering, no power brakes, no air conditioning, nothing. It's the most basic thing you could ever get, but it looks fantastic. This one, on the other hand, has everything except for air conditioning, but it's a beautiful car. It is. It's an absolutely beautiful car. Uh, so we'll get back to you guys a little later. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, we're, there's problems. Obviously, the brake calipers don't work, and 
It doesn't have power brakes. I don't think anyone out there has ever driven a car that doesn't have power brakes. There's going to be some people in the comments there. Maybe, maybe. And there they were. First was a completely clapped out 1968 up on cinder blocks with a non-original base model Chevy Nova replacement engine. A rat's nest of an interior, completely incomplete, missing paperwork, and the car exuded the feeling that it would never see the light of day again. I immediately shunned the car and laughed at the prospect of ever restoring such a nightmare. But that's not Winston. When Winston sees a pile of garbage, his mind begins assembling it into its final form in his imagination. To him, this pile of trash was a potential diamond in the rough. Negotiations began. The guy at the shop pulled the whole, We know what we got. This is an original 1968 and it's a manual transmission model. But it was clear that they, in fact, wanted this eyesore gone from their lot. They tried to sell it to him for $8,000, but after negotiating, he ended up getting it for $5,000. Now to get it home, there's no way this thing is going to run. But wait, where's mine? There was no way I was going to buy one of the other heaps in the lot at this place, so I figured, if I spend a little more, do I get more car? There she was, a pre-emissions regulation, red, 1974, with a new 460 horsepower 350 crate engine. It ran, it was complete, and it was ready to drive. Now I don't love red, but the fact that this one was already fast, ready to roll, and it was a manual, almost made me hesitate to ask the price. Turns out they wanted 15,000 for it, but I used the reverse logic on them. I know what you've got. It's a non-desirable 1974, and it's not original and proceeded to show them that I could find them for around 10 grand. So, 10 grand is, in the end, what I paid. Was the wife happy? No. But I knew I'd hold on to this car, and the price can only go up in the future, right? As I fired up the 350, the side pipes erupted into that sweet, sweet V8 roar, and I nervously pulled out of the parking lot. I say nervously because, my lord, did I not realize how badly cars were made in the 1970s. Yes, this thing was mint. Turns out mint in the 1970s meant shit. Rattly, terrible brakes, horrendous suspension, on or off power delivery, but man did this thing go. As I put my foot down, I realized how easily I could send this missile into a fiery burnout. And as I drove down the road, I saw how many people looked at the car. Thumbs up were coming at me from every angle and all of a sudden I remembered why, as a kid, I liked this car so much. It looks awesome. As I got out of the highway, I realized why 5-speed manuals were invented. This thing gets from 0 to 60 very fast. 5 seconds from my stopwatch. But when you get to 60, you stay there. For God's sakes, this car is sitting at redline just trying to get to highway speeds. Oh well, it's a pretty little city runabout then. Now, Winston and I have a Friday tradition. After work, we work on our cars. The thing is, there wasn't really anything to work on for mine. I ended up dyeing the interior leather black from its original doe skin color, but that was about it. Meanwhile, Winston was swearing at his heap like it had assaulted his own mother. Everything was in pieces, the engine was seized, the wheels, which were unoriginal, made it look like a clown car. He had to source pretty much every missing piece of the interior, and the costs were starting to make it look like it wasn't worth it at all. You see, there's this idea that if you buy an American car, it's Ford or GM or whatever parts are easy to find and they're very cheap. And that's true for the most part. Unfortunately, when you buy a Corvette, the Corvette namesake, that bragging right, that ties into the price. So you look at these companies like Eckler's Corvette or there's all kinds of you know third party um, sellers out there that sell Corvette parts. They're so much more expensive than say a part for Winston's Firebird, for example. So that's why we came up with this idea. Is it worth it to pay half for a disheveled wreck of your dream car and then put it together yourself? Are you gonna save money in the long run? Or is it worth it to bite the bullet, pay double, and buy the completed car you've always wanted? There's a lot of factors that go into this, the enjoyment of doing it yourself, but you also have to weigh out the costs and performance in the end. In this series, Worth It, we'll document Winston's journey and what he had to do to get his car to where he was happy with it and test them against each other. Price breakdown, drivability, drag race, dyno tests, we're gonna cover it all. We hope you guys are excited about it because we certainly are. Thanks for supporting us on patreon.com slash worthlesswhips. 
Uh, people get to vote on cars up there, and we post uh, behind-the-scenes content as well. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode, and we'll catch you next week.